Welcome to the Fear and Courage podcast, where we tell the stories of service of military members, law enforcement officers, and first responders. These careers are intense and in many ways foreign to the majority of people. Stories with intensity, unique experience, impactful personal results, positive or negative, and lives changed for the better or worse are the primary content. By telling impactful stories of education, training, operations, traumas, victories, career paths, and family experiences that come from service, we allow the listener to better understand the full impact of one person's choice to serve. I hope for the personal impact on those who serve to be a factor in the national conversation about decisions made regarding military deployment thresholds and national and state law enforcement and first responder policy and regulation. Thanks for joining us. Today on the show, we have John Flynn, a paramedic in Greenville, South Carolina. He enlisted in the Marine Corps right after high school in 1996 and served a four-year enlistment in the Marines from 1996 until 2000. After that, he worked as a construction engineering estimator for several years until he felt pulled back to service. He completed his EMT certification to the Phoenix Fire Academy in 2010, then his paramedic certification in 2012, and he's worked as a first responder in Greenville, South Carolina for almost five years. Welcome to the show. On each episode of the show, we highlight one nonprofit organization that serves veteran, law enforcement, or first responder communities and their families. On today's show, we're highlighting Upstate Warrior Solutions. Upstate Warrior Solutions is a community-based nonprofit organization that generates quality of life solutions for upstate South Carolina veterans, active duty, National Guard, and reserve warriors and their families. The Upstate Warrior Solutions model is centralized around face-to-face outreach to the warrior community and service lines, including mentorship, healthcare and benefits, education and training, housing, and employment. The model does not facilitate handouts, but dictates that the warrior walk alongside his or her peer mentor, program manager, or social worker in a team environment to generate goals and actionable solutions. Upstate Warrior Solutions adheres to the four-step plan of community integration for serving the warrior community, starting with Connect. They locate and link warriors and their families to the Upstate Warrior Solutions network of resources, followed by Educate. They inform warriors of services and opportunities available to them. Then advocate, they ensure warriors receive the support they've earned via peer and social work care coordination, and then collaborate. They work with their partners on all levels in the community to facilitate care for their target audience. The majority of the Upstate Warrior Solutions staff are volunteers, military veterans, and many have combat experience from Iraq and Afghanistan. These dedicated men and women stand ready to serve our warriors and family across Upstate South Carolina. If you'd like to check out or support Upstate Warrior Solution, all you have to do is go to upstatewarriorsolution.org and they've got all the information that you need, opportunities to donate. Any small dollar amount helps this the organizations like these. And I've seen personally the effects of the work that they do. Great organizations and really happy to highlight them on this episode. You'll hear some terms in this episode that may require a little explanation. John makes some cross references between first responder positions and what the equivalent responsibility is in a military unit, given that his experience is from both areas. The reference of an ammo man or an extra barrel refers to the assistant gunner or ammo bearer positions on a machine gun team, referencing for the, the helper or junior man on the team. The terms Mustang and ROTC, or Reserve Officer Training Corps, are used to refer to the programs in the Marine Corps that allow enlisted personnel to apply for and attend officer training programs in order to commission as an officer in the Marine Corps. NCO is an acronym for non-commissioned officer. These are enlisted personnel at the rank of corporal or higher who are in leadership positions within the military organization. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for thinking of me. (laughs) Yeah, you've got got an an interesting... uh, you you kind of hit up two of our criteria with some military service and work as a as a first responder. So yeah, I think that's you know it's right in line with with what we're trying to talk about. But yeah, I mean we can at least start at the beginning. We haven't talked a lot about any of your military service. You told a couple of stories, but you know I know you were in the Marine Corps and uh, and that's really about it. But when did so when did you enlist? Uh, yeah, well I was kind of just classic Greek recruiter dream you know i just pissed off 18 year old kid from phoenix and i um wanted to go kill communists and uh, have some adventures and so after high school about a month later i went and uh, went off to boot camp i wanted to go infantry and they obliged and one thing that i remember my dad said when i went in he says don't be pissed off ever don't be bitter about anything that happens because he knew 
what I didn't know because he'd been there and he said, you're going to get exactly what you asked for. Like exactly. You went into the Marine Corps and you went in the infantry and that's exactly what you asked for. Whatever that happens with that, whether you go off and to the Korean peninsula and, or you just sit in a fob for the whole time. Like it's, you get exactly what you asked for, whatever they need. So this, and this is pre nine 11. Yeah. So this was in 96. Okay. You know, there's nothing going on. And, um, I really didn't think that anything ever would go on. I just didn't make any sense. We are so big and so powerful. And, uh, why would anyone mess around? The economy was great. Everybody was happy. Um, it just didn't seem likely. So I did my bit and got out. And four years later, I'm uh, trying to figure out what to do with my life. And, um, you know, I wanted to be a writer. I, I also started boxing again. I boxed when I was in high school. And I thought I would, uh, it'd be a cool story to tell somebody someday I'd be a pro fighter. And um, it's kind of kicking rocks for about a year afterwards. And then 9-11 happened. And I was enjoying being out. I was enjoying being free, you know. I mean, I had a blast in the Marines. It was a pure boys club, um, you shoot guns and you just fight each other all the time. The infantry is a very special place. Marine Corps infantry, army infantry. Yeah. It's a very special place. And I, I say special because it's so focused on the task at hand every day. And that's being a better infantryman. Yeah. And and so it's you and, and you know, at that point in time, up to until very recently, it was all men, all focused on getting better at killing the enemy. That's it. And we lived in uh, the very top camp of um, Camp Pendleton. And it was all guys, you know, all just pissed off, angry, younger, 20-year-old infantry Marines running around doing PT, shooting guns. It was awesome. But I want to do something else because, like I said, there was nothing going on. So yeah. then when 9-11 happened, I thought, oh, man, am I going to really sign up for another four? Because if the Gulf War indicated anything, it's going to be over in three and a half hours. Like, what sure. are we going to do? I'm going to sign up for four years to go do this. And um, like six months went by and we're still getting it on. And I'm going, mm, maybe I should just do it. Maybe I should just sign back up. But before I did, I wanted to see Ireland first. Uh, I went over there for six months and then I was going to come back and I met a girl and that was it. <laughs> so my trajectory of life went a totally different way. And uh, with this, uh, my new wife and our kids and everything, I couldn't, that was no longer an option to go back in the military. Um, knowing what I knew then, it just wouldn't really be fair. So we came back to America a few years later, and um, I was a construction engineering estimator, um, figuring out how to build bridges and doing these different structures and concrete and underground water systems. And um, it was a great job. It paid pretty well. And I hated it. I, um, a little bit of a different feeling than Marine infantry. <laughs> yeah, man. It was, uh, it was so, I don't want to say pointless because the point was to make money and provide for my family. Well, that's, that's definitely a difficult transition, right? Because you're going from even, even in the military, not at war. I never experienced that personally. Uh, you know, I commissioned in 2006. So, but, but joining the military immediately places a significant amount of purpose on everything that you do. Sure. Whether you're at war or not, they, they're, they're very, very good at making you feel like you're a part of some grand purpose, some grand noble endeavor. And, I think that's a very common feeling when people get out is that it useless isn't the right word because you're getting valuable work done for, you know, you're either adding value to a company or you have a client that you're adding value to or whatever it is, but it, it definitely lacks that same feeling of purpose. Yeah. It lacks that kind of like a um, sense of nobility and like something bigger than yourself. Like you said, and especially for young men or men in general, they want to feel like, um, I think that they just want to have this feeling like they're doing something, like something for the people or something for the good, something that only they can really do. And they're sacrificing a little bit, but it's still, you know, there's still a little badassery in there. It's still kind of heroic and it's still exciting. And, and that, that's a specific mentality. I, I, it's tough to put that ideal 
on every young man out there in the world, but that is definitely an ideal that's common among people who join the military, especially yeah. folks that, that join the military and their first thought is, I want to go combat arms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Among that population, you find a pretty decent number of people that want to have some kind of effect on something that's bigger than themselves or, you know, have some kind of natural aggression or assertion and you want to go out there and get stuff done. And the military gives them that opportunity in spades. Yeah. They, the military is a perfect place for those kind of people because they can take these people that are willing to, you know, give up the ultimate sacrifice, the most noble thing. And um, they're willing to do that. They're like, yeah, come on in kid. You know, we got a job for you. So when you get out, you got, you don't really have that. And I understand in principle that you, you do, you know, like you said, with the, you want to make money for your family and do these things. And, Man, you know, I was just, I was kind of flailing. I just couldn't, um, I, I could see myself in another 20 or 30 years with a big gut and just bored with life and a Corvette maybe and just kind of miserable. I went to this um, neighborhood party of this family that I grew up with and uh, there was a guy there that I didn't see for a long time and he was kind of a fuck up when I saw him and now he's tall, good looking dude. He looks in shape and he's happy and, uh, and I said, what? What are you doing? What, what's going on with you? And he, uh, he's a Phoenix firefighter and he's a paramedic. Like, what? What the hell is that? How does that work? Like, and I thought immediately what most people probably do when I tell them I'm a paramedic is that they say to themselves, like, you know, I wonder what kind of weird shit this guy's seen or like how much awful stuff. And it's almost like, you know, it's almost like talking to a combat vet or somebody that doesn't talk about it or whatever because you're like, what has this guy seen? What yeah. kind of experiences he had that I don't have? So that was kind of the, the start of what, what put the idea in your head? Yeah, that talking was to him. Mark, really talking to him. And I kind of um, did a little research and we figured it out. And I came up with a bit of a plan and presented it to uh, the missus and she signed off on it. So they dropped everything work-wise and went on this new trajectory again to be an EMT initially. Yeah, so explain that a little bit about kind of EMT versus paramedic, what what those levels look like because I'm I'm not 100% familiar, but I think there's you know quite a few people who see it all as one thing. East Coast and West Coast are pretty they're kind of different in a lot of ways as far as how they provide this uh, in the field care. But um, EMTs are generally the lowest level that you have to go through. And it's usually like a semester of school. Um, you learn the CPR and you learn how to do everything that's not really practical outside of doing chest compressions. <laughs> like everything that you actually are going to do in the field, you haven't really picked up in those classes. And it's kind of on the job. You basically learn how to be a kind of surf for the paramedics you know you help them you, you learn to be the, the the helping hand of the paramedics the assistant basically yeah, you're the ammo you can, you're the ammo man you're the extra barrel guy on the on the team and so um and you do the driving and it's incredibly invaluable because it's kind of like being a mustang almost where you see what it's like what do you mean by process. mustang um you know like uh, you're an infantryman um, or you're enlisted you go through your enlistment, you go to college, then you go and be an officer. Mm -hmm. You kind of get both perspectives. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, so it's kind of, it was invaluable that way. And so the whole time I'm doing this, I'm going to the Phoenix Fire Academy and finally went to paramedic school. And this whole process took about two years to get to where I wanted to be. And so you were working as an EMT and that's what's uh, you know, paying the bills, yeah. I guess. Yeah, yeah. And you're you're kind of working towards work through the fire academy, working towards uh, getting certified as a paramedic. Yeah, yeah. And, okay. And basically doing the same kind of gig as a paramedic, except now I have a much bigger role and much more responsibility and much bigger chance to screw up and be on the hook for anything terrible that happens. Sure, it's somebody's life. <laughs> yeah. So you finished the paramedic school in Phoenix. Mm -hmm. And did you finish the fire academy there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And did you start, so did you start work as a firefighter and paramedic in Phoenix or did no, you? No, I was just a paramedic in Phoenix. Okay. I never got to, I really ride around in the trucks too much as a firefighter. Um, it was, I was on the ambulance most of the time. Okay. When I was a medic out there for a little while, uh, about a year, 
we decided to move out to the East Coast to uh, Greenville County, which is really, to be honest, is like real tip of the spear in a lot of ways in how they do things. And a little intimidating uh, as far as the clinical guidelines, how they do it compared to the rest of the country. In, in Greenville County, yeah. South Carolina, really? Yeah, really. They, uh, there's a, the training regiment and their, their protocols and everything is pretty out there. And so I thought that was interesting. And my wife is from Ireland, so she, we might as well have been on Mars going to Phoenix. You sure, know? So sure. So let's go someplace where it's green and we'll cut the distance in half. So the research and finding out about Greenville County's you know, training and operations. And then, uh, that, that kind of started the, the idea of, of moving to upstate South Carolina and it, yeah, really just, you know, the kids were still really young Sure. and growing up in Phoenix, I had a lot of reservations, but I love the town. That's where I grew up. But, um, there was a real opportunity for kids to get in trouble. And if my kids were anything like me, it would have it was spooky to me. Well, there's a lot of, there's a lot of value in leaving your hometown. Yeah. You know, being an adult in a different city than you were a kid in that, that, you know, that's not the best thing for everybody. Uh, for me, that was absolutely the case. And I think that for a lot of people, there's a very cleansing aspect to moving to a different city than you grew up in because you kind of get to get to make your own way and you, you get a little bit of a reset. Yeah, that. I think so. It gives you a bit more, um, you know, a bit more autonomy. Everybody, you know, you're an adult when you lived in your hometown, but you still, you get that feeling of like, well, here it is, I'm on my own and I'm, I'm going to make this work because there's no real going back. You know, you're responsible for all these other lives. And so yeah, you got to just keep pushing on, right? Sure. I mean, you have your family, your kids, That's it. you just had a major career change. Yeah. You got to figure that out. Yeah. Yeah. So now I'm a few years into this job and um, I'm in Greenville it's a, it's a kind of a wild system. So uh, that's something I want to get into a little bit, okay. mostly because I really don't know anything about this, but w so as a paramedic, you fit into a system of law enforcement and first responders mm -hmm. that get a call, right? So there's a, obviously what you do is centralized on the calls that you get to go respond. Correct. Right. That's, that's kind of the, that's the primary mission is, is respond to calls. Uh, but what, I guess where do you fit into that as a paramedic, and then what does a uh, what is what does the typical day or week look like? Yeah, that's the weird thing, man. We're like a kind of like the stepchild of uh, the first responders because you have you know firemen that have giant mustaches and uh, girlfriends, <laughs> and everybody loves them, right? They can't sure they have calendars. No They're heroes, and yeah. then you have uh, cops who are you know, just equally badass, but they also have these traditions and everything. And then we have paramedics who kind of um, play this huge linchpin role in these situations, but you, know, you don't have that same kind of tradition or that kind of. Yeah. I've never really thought about that because uh, coming from my military background and talking to, you know, having friends and, and colleagues and talking to law enforcement officers that, that were support on deployments mm -hmm. There's a lot of tradition in the military. There's a lot of tradition in, in law enforcement. You know, the whole thin blue line that, that just all of those things that, that unite all law enforcement officers. And if you've ever been to a, the funeral of a law enforcement officer killed on the job, it is a powerful, powerful thing. There's yeah. a lot of tradition basis to that. And, and there's a lot of that in law enforcement. And there's definitely a lot of that with firefighters, especially with you know, the recent history uh, among firefighters. So no doubt. Um, and it, and it's, so, um, so we kind of sit in between, we fall kind of between the stools there, but the firemen and the cops know what we bring to the table. And, you know, we run all these calls together. So we sure. all know each other. So like a typical night, we'll, I'll sign on and check off my truck and make sure everything's there. And um, usually I'll have an EMT partner who unfortunately for him just ends up usually driving me around most of the night and uh, get a call, go out. And that's the thing. That's the thing about the job is that you just don't know, you know, you don't know what the call is going to be. You it's just a hundred percent reactionary. Totally. I mean, you'll get a call and it'll be something coming through. They'll give us notes on it, uh, breathing problem, 25 year old male. And then you start coming up with these different scenarios up into like all the way to like what this guy's wearing like you have based off of where the call is and what this guy looks like 
it's purely experience based. Totally, and, and it's not always, you know, of course, not accurate. Sometimes it's like nuts on, but um, <laughs> it can be a breathing problem. But you show up, and it's a breathing problem because a guy has a knife sticking out of his chest. You just <laughs> forgot to mention that shit because they don't want the cops to be there. It could be like, you know, it could be anything, and it could be total bullshit. We go to calls all the time, screaming through the city with lights and sirens, and it's just, it's a bunch of crap. And that's the moral buster right there. That's what do you mean by a bunch of crap? It's somebody who's overreacting or not yeah. actually injured or... You know, and it could, it could be an old lady that uh, her her kids don't visit her very much. She's bummed out yeah. and she, it's four in the morning and she can't sleep. And so, well, you know, I kind of I hit my shin a few days ago and I uh, really like to get it checked out. I'm like, lady, it's fucking four in the morning. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> and you got to kind of nut up yeah. and be nice just like you would to anybody else. But, sure. I mean, and in, in those situations you're running into somebody who's at it either at their own crisis point in life and there's no use in making that worse by that's it exactly by being an ass there's a lot of different types of people that do this job um i like one of the things i enjoy about it is like the judo the mental judo aspect of it is when you get somebody that obviously is bullshitting you or maybe they're upset about something and it's not really a crisis but you can calm them down or you can act like you're really taking them seriously and like you don't don't sweat it we're going to take care of you and being able to handle the situation because most people will call 911 because they're having the worst day of their life sure and it's that chaos that you love so much because it's just you're used to it you see it all the time you see car accidents all the time you see gunshots and overdoses and you see dead people and you see it all the time and it's not a big deal anymore well, i think it definitely takes a specific kind of person to want to operate in that chaos, right? I, I know what that feels like, that where everything's going wrong, you can get a handle on it and make progress and it'll be fine and you're comfortable in that place. Yeah, uh, That takes a particular personality, I think. Um, yeah, but you also, see, yeah, you got to kind of remember, because I think about it sometimes, I'm like, how can all of these people do this job successfully all the time. And it's because they have very little skin in the game, realistically. Whereas in the military, you could die. Sure. Your men could die. You're not going to die on this job unless something insane happens. Sure. It doesn't usually happen. If you're a medic in the military, you're dealing with people that get gunshot or stabbed or blown up. But you're in the firefight too. But yeah, and, and they look like you. They're wearing your uniform. They sure. could be your boys. You know, they, there's an emotional attachment to those type of people. Whereas we don't know these people. I'll meet them. I'll see them for 25 minutes and then I'm done. I'll never see them again. Yeah. Hopefully. And uh, that's it. There's definitely a difference in the emotional effect when you, when it's your friend versus someone you you've never met before and you'll never see again. For sure. Uh, if I were to work on cops or firemen every single day or paramedics, like people that I know, my brain would be mush. Yeah, that's. I, I never really thought about that. The idea of uh, a kind of who your patient base is and how that affects your emotional response. It's easy to detach from that too because they're generally, um, a, you know, half the time the traumas are one guy who's some form of ne'er do well shooting another ne'er do well. So you're not totally invested emotionally in. and i'm sure there's a lot of self-inflicted uh there's there are plenty of self-inflicted injuries that that you respond to where uh it's a little bit different when something your emotional response is going to be different when something is self-inflicted due to negligence mm -hmm. than it is when someone's involved in a noble endeavor mm. you know there's 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 a very different response to injuries in those environments, I would imagine. Yeah, and it's funny. You'll see, ask anyone that has worked on like a cop that's been shot or a cop that's um, been hit by another a drunk driver or something. It's on. Like, you're going to make sure that this guy gets, You elevate your game. Yeah, and, and you make sure that everybody knows that, hey, this is a guy that you need to pay attention to and we're taking care of. And... um you know, all bets are off. Whatever, whatever this guy needs, he's priority. There could be, you know, a few patients on scene that are jacked up, but if the cop looks like he's in trouble, then that's the guy, that's the guy that's going to save my life. Yeah. Cause they're crazy people out there, man. Like, sure. Crazy. And I get to see them in their environment and it's a trip. Yeah. I would, I would imagine exposure to that 
really the the kind of injuries that you get called to in a lot of cases are the kind of injuries that many people will see happen maybe once in their lifetime. Yeah. See someone get stabbed in the chest. Most people will never see anything like that in their life. Yeah. Or not necessarily the action because you don't, you know, you don't see it when it happens in the moment, but you're seeing the result. You're seeing the injury. And that's a kind of thing that's just very unfamiliar. It, well, and it usually is, it's pretty fresh, right? So we'll get a call that uh, there's a fight breaking out and um, hang out around the corner so the cops can clear the scene and make sure, again, cops are going in there, putting themselves in front of us, making sure everybody's cool and uh, we're good to go inside. And somebody could have just got stabbed or shot or something, something happened. And um, there are times when something like that takes place, you can get so transfixed on this giant gaping hole that you lose sight of what you're really supposed to be doing or maybe lose sight of what the actual problem is. It can be really distracting. Sure. You know, an open fracture on the leg could be pretty distracting in a car accident, but the real issue is the guy just actually popped a lung and you can't see it Mm -hmm. and he's, he can't breathe anymore because of that. Yeah. The triage, triage of injuries in an environment like that, where there's a lot of variables at play still, uh, and there's a lot of visual distractions the uh, only way to get a, a, a handle on that is by repetition, just experience. You got to do it over, just like everything else, right? Sure. Like anything. You got to do it over. I, I, I know everybody does this, but it's kind of, it's, you know, it's like a jujitsu kind of thing. Like when you are a white belt and your first day on the mat and you see these blue belts just wrecking you that are like 50 pounds less, you're like, you're in what awe. Is this sorcery? Like, how do they do this? Right. Yeah. In, in all things, I think martial arts is a very good example of, of, an area where there are levels yeah, and the difference between the first level and a higher level seems almost impo- like the gap mm-hmm. seems almost impossible to bridge. Yeah. And for sure. you know, and it's slowly sure. And then slowly with experience and repetition, you kind of get there and it's not, you're right. So you don't like all of a sudden say, Hey, I've arrived. I'm here. I've gotten this level. It's just like, yeah, I'm comfortable and I'm a little more confident in my ability, but at the same time, I'm humble because I know that it can go really bad if something else happens. If a, if a higher belt comes in or if I don't pay attention, something bad's going to happen. See something you've never seen before. Right. You're not, you know, you're not up on everything that you need to be to be staying you know, staying good at, staying proficient at. If you let some of that stuff slide, you're going to see something new and suffer as a result. Yeah. And that's the same thing with being a medic. And you, you, uh, you got to be confident that you know what your training is. There's a SOP. There's our rules that we can follow, and there's algorithms. And you can be a robot and stay within those those lines and do exactly what you're supposed to do. Generally, everything will be okay. There's sometimes where you got to be a little creative. You know, it's an it, it's it's interesting. Coming into an environment like that, you know, you you called to a to the scene of some injury, mm-hmm. but it's in the event that it's a you know there's a violent crime that precipitated the injury or something like that, and you're called immediately. A lot of times, you you get the call when the incident starts, mm-hmm. and so you're on the way while the incident's happening. I would imagine there are times when you've arrived and you felt pretty concerned for your own safety on a call, or you've been in environments which are pretty which are pretty dangerous, but you know, at risk of personal injury, I guess. People are kind of, um, they don't know you, but uh, they know that you're a paramedic and you're not going to arrest them. So we got that going for us. Like they're, they're, they're not afraid of, uh, they know that we're there for, to help them. Um, there are definitely neighborhoods that you want to be careful where you're at in different apartment complexes and different things. Uh, you want to have your head on a bit of a swivel, but um you know, for the most part, you just have to keep an eye on people and be that there's that confidence again, because if people think that you're, you're scared and you don't know what you're doing, it's, you know, it, it'll backfire on you. It'll immediately exploit that big time and they can smell that. So if I'm in a situation where people are getting crazy, I'm not, what am I going to fight somebody just because they're drunk and they don't want to go to the hospital or whatever? I'm, Look, you can go ahead and bleed out, and then when you're asleep or dead, I'll I'll go to work, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna roll around on the ground with you, crazy, sure, man. <laughs> um, so you just you gotta um, use common sense and not be 
that's the problem with a lot of people that are new, like a lot of new medics or EMTs, is that they have this like kind of position of authority. So they talk a lot of shit to people, especially drunk people or crazy people, because they're like, well, wait, you know, what are you going to do? You're going to go to jail if you touch me. Sure. But they don't care if they go to jail. They will fucking kill you. You got to understand that. So give these people respect. But then don't take any shit from them either. Yeah, that's definitely a factor when you're when you're responding to calls and you don't know who the person is. Is it's just that is you don't know who you're dealing with. Yeah, and you're coming into a situation that's very unfamiliar. Don't know who the people are, and it's it's probably a pretty good idea to not get involved in the conflict yourself. And you can never you meet somebody and you size them up like real quick. Everybody does, especially guys. They'll look at a guy and they'll be like. I think I could probably take that. Guy, right? like that <laughs> natural and incl- natural inclination. Totally. And I'll meet somebody at work and I'll be like, that guy's probably not sick. He's fine. Or he's bullshitting. He probably, sure. His girlfriend just broke his heart and he can't take it. Whatever. He's not really crazy. But then there have been a couple of people that I've met that like crazy wouldn't really do it justice. And I couldn't really describe to anyone accurately enough the creepiness of these people. But initially when I met them, they look like normal human beings. So g- give me an example of something like that. Uh, so it's like three in the morning. We go to this uh, apartment complex or this uh, hotel. And there's a guy that calls because he's depressed. Uh, oh, good. Right. I'm, it's three in the morning. Like I want to go home soon. I, I'm trying to finish the stupid paperwork. And now we got to go to, because this guy's depressed at a hotel. And it's raining and he's sitting outside of this room. And we pull up and I'm like, come on, buddy. Let's go get in the ambulance. He gets in. And he sits down and I'm not really paying attention. I take his blood pressure and check him out a little bit. And he's kind of got long hair and he's like, uh, so what's the story, bud? Are you depressed? And he's like, yeah. And he's, you could smell alcohol on him. And sure. Do you have anything to drink? And he doesn't seem drunk. And he's like, yeah, a couple of beers. He said, uh, you feel like hurting yourself or anything? Asking standard questions. And mm-hmm. he says, uh, yeah, I'm thinking about it. And I said, you ever tried anything before? And I literally like barely look at this guy up until this point. And he goes, yeah, I tried to cut my head off once. And I stopped, I looked up and I said, bullshit. Uh, that's, a, that's an interesting answer to that yeah, question. It's bullshit. What do you mean try to cut your head off? Show me. And he whips his hair back and he's got this lightning bolt scar like on the side of his neck. And I went, well, and this is the first time I'm like looking in this dude's eyes and they're black, like movie, scary guy, black, right? And he's just <laughs> looking at me like this. And I went, whoa, whoa, how'd you do that? He goes, I took a knife and I started sawing and I hit a bone and just kept going. And then the next thing I woke up and I was in the hospital and Jesus was there with me. What? And he said, yeah, you believe in Jesus? And I went, big time, big time, buddy. Yeah, totally, whatever, man. But he was, you could see in this guy's face, he was on the level. Like somebody had told him to cut his own head off with a knife. That's commitment, man. That. That's, That's really unbelievable. Good. Yeah, it was wild. So you, anyway, something, things like that make you go, okay, well, you don't know what's in this guy's brain. Yeah, you, you don't know how deep the level of, uh, I don't know, crazy is a, a blanket word for stuff like that, but you don't know how deep that level of disturbed goes with, with someone when you first show up. And that's the thing, too, is people, when you show up, can be very friendly you know, like people that are going to hurt themselves. You can't always tell, you know, they may be very happy and you're like, everything seems normal. You show up in a guy's apartment and apologizes for having to call you and everything. And he says, I'm just going to get my shoes. And you're like, okay, buddy. And everything seems good. And he goes in his closet to get his shoes. And then you hear a boom because the guy shot himself with the gun in the closet. Wow. No indication. But this guy could have easily walked out into out of the closet and killed all of us first. So it's that kind of situational awareness that you can't get. So is that an actual story that happened oh, yeah. to you? Yeah. And it's, it's stuff like that, that, you know, that, that gives you a little pause. Sure. So, yeah, that, I think it's safe to say that an experience like that might give you a little, uh, you know, more than just a little pause when coming into unfamiliar yeah. situations. So you start following the crazies into the bathroom when they get their shoes. Yeah. That, or you start following anyone anywhere when you've been called because they have an issue. Yeah. <laughs> And usually cops are good about that. You know, sometimes there's young guys that are cops are just people too. And some people have more experience than others. And so something else I, I, I thought about with regard to, to, you know, your, your job and what you do for, for a living is car accidents and how, you know, most, most people, when they drive down the road, they'll see a car accident here or there. They'll see, you know, they feel the inconvenience, mm-hmm. but 
car accidents are happening all the time. Yeah. And more often than not, you know, most times it's, I would assume there's, you know, there's a fender bender, people get a little bit banged up or a concussion, but is that, are car accidents the majority of what you get called to, or is it just, is it just one more facet? Yeah. It's just one more thing. It just depends. It's maybe 10% of everything. Oh, really? Do. Yeah. Not even. And they're usually, you just don't know. Um, if, if dispatch will get like several calls, multiple calls for one car accident, then you kind of turn the heat up a little bit because you're like, hmm, this is kind of spooky. What, you know, maybe something interesting is going on. When there's you know people stopping and calling and yeah, well, the thing is, car accidents too is that they're so sudden and so violent and unfamiliar to people that that noise and that sudden they're very loud. <laughs> yeah, and it freaks people out, and so they don't know if something's hurt or if they're just freaked out. And, you have to you have to kind of err on the side of caution most of the time, and a lot of things that are big indicators, you know, not even all the time, man. It's so weird. People will fly out of a car and be fine. Usually drunk people, and then somebody gets, um, you know, somebody gets hit, and uh, their aorta tears, and they're talking to you, and they're fine, and then like a thermometer, they're head starts to get white and then their nose and their lips and then they're dead like it's a weird thing so you can never really tell what's going to happen to somebody but cars can be a good indicator like the damage to the cars yeah side impact windshield scarring that kind of stuff well that's definitely something that you hear is people who are drunk when they get in a car accident, they have a lower likelihood of injury or it's the drunk driver who kills people in a wreck and then isn't hurt at all himself. Is that something you see? A lot. Yeah. And it's, um, it really makes me mad. It's a, it's a strange thing that you can't, um, do anything about. And the person is so worried about covering his ass generally because they know what just happened. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the guy that's not drunk is the one that usually pays the price for that. And I know I sound like a public service announcement oh, sure. and it's, it's wild. A lot of times a drunk driver will hit a, like if you're driving a motorcycle, you're a lot more likely, I think, to get hit by a drunk driver because they don't, they don't see you as well. They're just, uh, motorcycles are just smaller in general. Yeah. And when you're drunk, your ability to see smaller things on the road is impaired just like everything For else. For sure. And it's, um, maybe they think they have a little bit more room because the headlights on the other side, whatever it is, it's a weird thing, but, um, that's why I don't have a motorcycle because it would, I would feel like such an asshole if I told my kids I died because I, uh, drive around a motorcycle. Well, I definitely cool. used to have one. Yeah, me too. Uh, at, you know, early twenties yeah. in the military, I was married, but my wife was in school. So I was living with roommates that were fellow lieutenants going out to the range, shooting guns every day. Mm -hmm. I bought a motorcycle and drove a motorcycle to work. And, you know, I had that moment of realization too, where every time a car hits a motorcycle, the motorcyclist loses far more, far worse, far more than the driver of the car. And I had that moment of realization that, you know, I'm married and I want to have kids someday. I want to get there to do that. But also once I have kids, if I drive a motorcycle, the number one likely reason I believe that I, that I might kick the bucket early would be that motorcycle. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I had that, that realization as well. There's nothing you can do, man. This guy last week, he, he was kitted up. He looked like a F-16 fighter pilot. I mean, just leather everywhere, cool boots, cool helmet, had like lightning bolts on it and shit. Awesome. All the protective Car equipment you everything. want. Car dries out in front of him, just open pelvis fracture. Trashed. This guy's trashed shit everywhere. And it's like car accidents like that where you show up and you can get really focused on the pretzel that it's the human being in front of you where you need to sometimes i'll sometimes like make a little lap around the dude you know what i mean kind of like give yourself 10 seconds to breathe and assess yeah and it's it's important to be able to remember to do that sometimes i most of the time i don't put my gloves on my um rubber gloves because i wait to do it while i'm on scene that forces me to talk to somebody or forces me to take in what's going on. It gives you, it, it builds in 10 seconds where you can calm your mind and make a rational decision. Exactly. Cause you've seen some shit where people get turned inside out and you're like, what am I looking at? What is this? Is that his, is that his face? What is that? 
It's, it's weird. Man. Yeah, the level of trauma is something that I think is astonishing to people who don't see it every day uh, or really ever. You know, mo- like I said earlier, uh, you can beat this dead horse over and over again is that most people just don't see physical traumas yeah, uh, well, on a regular basis. And you can get used to it, right? Like, sure. Everybody gets used to weird shit. Like working in a butcher shop for me would be disgusting, but people do it every single day. And they, they, um, it's not weird to them at all. You, you, you get used to it. And like I said, you have that detachment for people that you don't know, but that's the thing that you really look forward to that I look forward to because the trauma brings the most drama. It's the most chaos, and sure. the most excitement. It's also the most intense feeling of accomplishment when you achieve success. Yeah. Well, it's, there's not a lot to it too. Usually. I mean, there's people can get pretty hemodynamically unstable when they lose a lot of blood. Right. And mm-hmm. they, you have to figure out how to stop that and then somehow correct that enough to get them to the trauma bay. But as a medic, you show up to this call and you have an EMT partner and then you have like four or five EMT firefighters who might not even be EMTs. And then you have a bunch of cops and all this shit is going on and you are the guy that they're all looking at. You have to direct traffic. This is what I need. This is what I need. You start doing this. We're on a, we're on like on a relay here. Two minutes after he's done, you need to do this. Set me up this, you know what I mean? And you got to kind of- assess. You immediately become the guy in charge. That's it. And they're more than happy to dish that shit off to you. Like, tell me what to do, boss. And it's on. And yeah, that's an interesting thing that uh, that comes up in traumatic situations is all sense of authority and rank and everything goes out the window or goes goes secondary yeah. to- the task at hand and who has the specialty and the ability to get the task at hand done. Yeah. Cause they want that. They want to have confidence in you that you know what you're doing. And as again, you got to have confidence that cause I work with the same people a lot. You see the same people all the time. They know if you're a clown or you're not sure. And I mean, they know me and I show up and I'm kind of, you know, I cut up with them a little bit. We joke around. Um, and that, you've got credibility. That's it. And you've yeah. got to, Reputation is huge in this, just like any any combat arms uh, job. Um, you know, you, reputation's huge. If you are a um, shitbird and you don't care or you don't know what you're doing or you can't take control of the situation, you're not going to be taken seriously and it's not going to be effective for the guy that you're trying to take care of. Because when you're like, I need this done, they're like, well, why don't we do it this way? You're like, no, fuck no. We're doing it <laughs> yeah. this way because I told you. You need you need to have that response be okay and then action taken. Mm-hmm. And that comes with credibility and, well, it comes with authority and authority is built with credibility. I think so, yeah. That's exactly. And you, I work very hard and be very aware of uh, how calm I can make a scene. You know, if I'm not running around and I'm not trying to throw somebody in the back of the ambulance to go, and the patient's freaking out. That's what I tell them. I'm like, look, man, if you, if I'm not moving fast and we don't have the lights and sirens on, just, just take it out a little bit. You're, you're, you're going to be fine. Let's bring it down. Here. It's not a big deal. Trust me. I know what I'm doing. Yeah, you're going to make it. Mm, hopefully, they do. Yeah. Being the one that brings that calm and that control to an environment like that. I would imagine that brings you credibility pretty quickly among the the community you work in because yeah, fun. they yeah they they anybody in a trauma situation on a, on a scene when something terrible just happened everyone there just wants for that to go away you know they want for it to be better and by being the person that brings kind of the calm and control to the situation you give them a little dose of what they want there right I and mean, you want to be you want to be calm but you want to be purposeful because there are some people that tone it down so much that they turned it off and they're complacent sure. or they're lazy. And you have to have a little bit of spark in you. You know, you want to, you want to get that shit done, but, um, at uh, calm with a sense of urgency. That's it. Yeah. 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 So that's a hard thing to achieve. It's an easy thing to say, but calm with a sense of urgency is that comes from an intense practice. <laughs> That's it. You, well, you you know you, it's experience. You just you you can be taught all of this cookbook stuff to be a paramedic, but or to you know to be a platoon commander or to whatever. And if you don't have the experience to be able to adapt or recognize situations, then it's going to be more difficult. But it gets easier every time. 
<laughs> you know, most calls are different than each other. You have to be prepared for that and be flexible for it. Most calls can be different. Yeah, the, it's it's almost like, uh, you know, the example that people give for a stressful situation, the military example is in a firefight, mm-hmm. right? That's that's the classic example of the, the measure of how well someone does under pressure, uh, the in a firefight kind of example. And I think the reason why that's the example is because there is that perception of danger or the reality of danger in that situation. So how do you, how do you act? How do you perform when there's a significant amount of risk on the table? Yeah. And on a call where there's a significant trauma is a very, very similar environment to that firefight example. Not that there's direct danger to you, but the fact that there is risk of grave consequences Mm -hmm. and a requirement to perform is the exact same. Yeah. And, um, you know, traumas, like I said, traumas are the easy part. They, it's easy. You, you've you identified the problem. Is the guy breathing? If he's not, let's fix that. If he's bleeding, then let's stop that. And then and then let's get him to the trauma. Because what they really need is a trauma bay. They need yeah. a smart doctor. Uh, they don't need- They need to get into aid. an operating room. Yeah, exactly. So you got to figure out how to get them into the ambulance, packed it up um, as fast as can, and then get them to- Within reason. That might be a common misconception. I mean, everyone knows that the ambulance goes to the hospital and the hospital is where surgery happens, but you do everything you can to package, prep, stabilize. That's yeah, kind of the core of the job is get them to the OR, right? Yeah. I want to get them there alive. That's my goal. And also have things in place so that they can pick up where I left off. Set them up for success. For, for the guy's success, right? Because it's a, um, it's a total ego trip for me. I want this person who's dead or who has died to come back to life. And then I want him to walk out of the hospital. That's got to be an incredibly powerful feeling when someone's flatlining and you can figure out a way to quite literally bring them back to life. Yeah, it's cool. It's real mechanical though. Human beings are real mechanical and sometimes it works. And sometimes you just have a faulty engine and there's just nothing you can do about it. When you bring somebody back to life and then a week later or two weeks later, they walk out, that's pretty rad. It's cool. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you almost feel some some ownership of their ability to live out the rest of their life. Kind like, of, yeah. But still, there's always that detachment where like- ah. You might not be interested in whether or not they win their soccer game next Saturday. Right. But the idea of having powerful control over human life like that. It's neat to think that, um, hey man, this shit works. Yeah. You know? Like, wow, that, that drug really did work. That was cool. The first time somebody comes back to life, I would imagine that's a very uh, comforting feeling in your training being yeah, effective. Yeah, it's a big time affirmation where you're going, okay, all right, that worked. And then there's there's things that people do that are like real high speed medics that are that you pick up. You know, you've seen like older guys do this that are actively, because sometimes you can get complacent. And you're like, this is the way we always done it. Sure. There are some guys that uh, have techniques and things that they get pretty ninja with it. And I'm a ham and eggs kind of dude. Like if it's broke, let's fix it. If it's not like, I don't care what the name of this disease is. Is he breathing? You know, is it, sure. It, so you're you're a you're a get the person alive and prepped for surgery to the hospital. Yeah, so, <laughs> as best as you can. Right, and it's um, but there are there are always ways to improve. There are always ways to throw in like cool little little techniques or new things to help you figure it out and diagnostic. It's all diagnostic. Well, the trauma medicine in the past fifteen years has been turned on its head completely when it comes to uh, advancement of techniques, advancement of equipment, and just general knowledge base of, of you know, professionals who, who deal with trauma medicine, you know, a country at war and how that advances, you know, trauma medicine in general is, uh, is significant. So I think that, yeah, there's, there's always going to be an opportunity to improve. And, and if you see someone out there whose job it is to you know, save people's lives or at least contribute to that in the best way possible, arrive on the scene and address traumas. You know, most people would want to think that there's folks who are out there yeah. doing everything they can to stay on top of the latest information and training and techniques. And Yeah. Yeah. And it's, um, it's unfortunately that the reason is because of all these different conflicts and all this different trauma that's happened overseas that we've paid attention to that though, and been able to figure out a lot of different ways to, to help take the lessons learned and best practices. Yeah. But generally speaking, man, time is always the issue with trauma. 
if you're not there in time to stop it, or you're not there in time to get them to the, the operating table, then it's just not meant to be. And the guy's done. Um, the, the medical calls are always weird because you can't see it all the time. Uh, the heart attacks or these things. So a, like a non, non-physical non trauma, you know, not a car accident, a gunshot wound, a, right. a stabbing, uh, some, you know, you you get called to the straw that broke the camel's back for some medical condition. Yeah. And it's weird. You get like, you get a call like a 45 year old guy, um, no cardiac history at all, um, having chest pain. And uh, that's the call that you get. And I know now that okay, I should really pay attention to this because before I'm like, what are you talking about? He's got no cardiac history. He's, he's a pretty young guy. Like He's probably just out of breath. Right. He's sitting at the kitchen table and all of a sudden, you know, he's with his kids and his wife and they're whatever. And uh, Fox News is on in the background and all of a sudden this guy starts, I got a chest pain and heart attacks hurt apparently a lot. <laughs> apparently it's really painful. He's screaming and yelling and, that's good to know that you're not going to have a heart attack, at least not a deadly one and or, you know, a serious one and not realize it's happening. <laughs> but, but no, man. Sometimes you, I've gotten guys with like full third degree heart attacks, heart blockages, and they're totally fine. Really? Like you and I. It's so weird. Such a mixed bag, it's I so guess. Weird. Yeah. But I guess I should say heart attacks can hurt a lot. Those are pretty heavy too. Yeah. I would imagine. So this, this is something that I've discussed with uh, friends that are uh, social workers Mm -hmm. or medics or doctors is the idea of compassion fatigue. Yeah. Right. Like at at some point when you see enough tragedy, it affects you in a way where you you require some off time or recovery time. You know, in deployed experiences, uh, seeing, you know, you see dead bodies, you see dead people that that affects someone, especially, you know, the first time you see you see something like that, especially someone who died as a result of trauma. But the idea of seeing uh, children who died or children who died due to negligence or children who died due to trauma or, you know, anyone who like easily avoided silliness that, that killed someone who didn't need to die young, mm-hmm. you know, I, I would imagine that you see that more often than the average person, clearly. Uh, yeah. how do you manage that kind of thing? Yeah, that's a weird thing because it intermingles with fatigue, like legitimate fatigue. I, I tell everybody like- Physical hardest, fatigue you're talking about. Like, yeah, yeah. Well, like you're just tired. Just you've being exhausted on the job, hours, sure. And, and you're wrecked. You're emotionally wrecked. You're physically tired. You're in, Then you go to a, a, a house where some drunken asshole leaves his pit bull um, that he- you know, gives a kick to every once in a while in the same house with this beautiful little four-year-old kid and takes off half his face. You can't beat the father to death at that time because you have to take care of this kid. Sure. But you want to. And the kids are always the tough one. You know, everybody says that there's nothing unique about that. It, but um, it's tough because there's that real emotional aspect to it where they're just like human beings. They're just a little smaller and uh, it shouldn't be that difficult. But, but it is. It is. It's a drag um, because they're so innocent and they don't have a say in what they're doing. We went to a car accident once where this little fender bender, no big deal, um, but it was a cardiac arrest, like a pediatric cardiac arrest. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? And there's this little little kid, like six-month-old kid in the back of this car in a car seat and like very low pulse rate, the kind that where I have to start doing compressions. Like, what the hell happened? The kid's strapped in and everything. I don't understand. His uncle had been watching him. He just, like, rear-ended somebody. And my partner, this is when I was still pretty young, um, new at this, who was an EMT also, um, or an EMT, and he looked at this kid's eyes, and somehow he was like, look at his eyes, man. They're pinpoint. Like, no. I mean, I took an IO, you know, in this kid's shin. Didn't even flinch. This kid was wow. going to die. I went, what, dude? So I hit this kid with Narcan, boom, woke right up, screaming and crying. So explain explain what the issue was and, and what, what the Narcan did or, so, or why that was a weird situation. So what happened was uh, the uncle who was watching him was trying to get high and uh, was pissed off because the kid was crying. So he crushed up some opiates and put it in the kid's bottle. Uh, kid stopped breathing. Luckily, he noticed, so he started driving to the hospital, but he was high, so he ran into some. 
So somebody called 911 and they said, hey, what's with that kid? He looks dead. And the kid wasn't quite dead, you know, but he was. He was on on death's door. He was scratching at death's door. He was like, let me in. But um, yeah, the Narcan anyways acts as kind of like a buffer between it, the opiates. So and, it knock the opiates off the receptors or something like that? Yeah, or? yeah, yeah. So it just blocks it. The trick sure. is to be able to get enough Narcan in somebody to offset the opiates because when the Narcan wears off, that opiate is going to rush back in. And we'll wake up guys that are barely breathing, that are, especially now, there's a lot of it um, after overdose on heroin or fentanyl. And they wake up and it's like, they're fine, totally fine. Nope, I don't want to go to the hospital. I'm good. Nope. <laughs> okay Just that's got to be incredibly back. satisfying when a child wakes up from death's door like that though yeah that was pretty cool that was pretty unique you don't see that very often a lot of times you get these poor families that have the little kid and they don't know it's their first kid and they roll over on them and they wake up in the morning oh, that that's a tough one to deal with man on, i can't on. imagine what arriving on that call yeah has to be like because that you are in i mean this this happens often as you are in the middle of someone's worst moment of their life. Their worst moment ever. And for you, it's just another day. Not to be cool about it or like cruel about it, but. You can't let it be the worst moment of your life too. Yeah, I'm going home. And it doesn't, it's not like a discipline thing. I mean, I get bummed out sometimes when I think about it, but it it's mixed with the physical fatigue. The mental fatigue is mixed with the physical fatigue. And it's I don't even really talk to my family about it anymore. Not, you know, like I need to or anything, but like, I just don't want to talk about it. There's nothing to talk about. It's like- A lot of times it's just not a fun subject. Yeah. You know? I, I don't need to exercise the demons here. It's just, uh, it's what it is. And we, we bullshit about it at work and there's the gallo humor kind of thing, which helps burn it off. But you know, for me, it's just hanging out with the kids and my wife and lifting weights and doing jujitsu. And that just really kind of offsets. It's awesome. Yeah, that so something that I think is very clear in any situation like this, in any profession where you deal with something something that you could describe as different from normal human interaction, mm-hmm. right? Like and you know, referencing trauma or intense stressful environments, uh, you have to have a form of therapy. There there has to be something that you do to burn off what you've built up, yeah. and whether that's talking to somebody or working out or jujitsu or, you know, whatever it is, uh, you have to have that. It has to be a physical thing too. You, I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of value to that physical exertion, clearing the mind. Yeah. We're human beings and we, um, we need, we're, we're not made to be sedentary all the time. And when you're on an ambulance, for your 12 hour or 24 hour shifts, you can be like sitting down and then you're up for a few minutes and then you're sitting down all the time. That's why these guys are all, you know, there's a lot of porkers that are, uh, they just eat garbage food. They're kick-ass paramedics and they'll, they'll do whatever they can for you, but they're just, they're, their well, diet's garbage. Look at the life. environment too, is that you're sitting in the ambulance a lot. Yeah. And when you're hungry at one in the morning, your yeah, option is the gas station. Yeah. And that's what they live on, QT hot dogs. And it's tough. I mean, you have to offset that, not just for your physical self, but like you said, for like your mental well-being. And it's, um, it's, really, it's really important, I think. I'm kind of cobbling together all these thoughts in this book that I'm, I'm writing about these subjects. And one of the chapters is just solely based on this. You have to find something that you do, a diet and exercise that you do. And getting out on the mat and choking someone to near death is one of the best things that you could possibly, or even getting choked. It's awesome. Yeah. That, well, jujitsu itself is, uh, for me and, and for many, you know, for many people that, that we've both spoken to and, you know, many people in the, in the public space that jujitsu has become pretty significant as a sport in the United States, but it is, it's got the unique aspects of, uh, or I guess it combines the aspects of extreme physical exertion at high intensity. Yeah with conflict right yeah. because you're in a fight yeah and discomfort and, and exactly so you can have that extreme exertion and extreme high intensity fitness activity coupled with conflict that you resolve at the end of every match every five minute session you know you you have these this brutal, brutally physically challenging activity that puts you in conflict that gets resolved and then you shake hands say thanks buddy and yeah. 
on to the next one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's uh, great. And there's no emotional, you're not emotionally distraught usually after it. Sure. It's just, it's a lot like being a medic. You know, you're not emotionally distraught usually after it. You're just a little worn out. But you kind of let it go. You learn from it and just move on. And if you don't, if you don't have that therapy, you don't get the daily clearance of that emotional buildup. You That's know, true. because it, you will become emotionally distraught if you go for months of exposure to trauma situations, exposure to extreme emotional situations, even when you've got some distance, mm -hmm. you know, if you have no outlet, no therapy at all, nothing that serves to clear your mind, uh, you will find yourself in that position of emotionally distraught for sure. Yeah, no question about it, man. You, um, for me, a nightmare right now would be a normal job. I couldn't do it. It would be too hard for me. I would freak out. And by normal job, you mean, you know, the standard corporate America, go to an office, sit at a computer. Yeah. And sometimes I'm super jealous because I'm working at night or I'm working on the weekends and it's a drag or I'm, it's Christmas and I have to go deal with this tool down the road that called me because the stuff is dope <laughs> or he can't stop drinking and now it's sad. Like, Fuck. But uh, <laughs> there's, I, I'm sure that you have some of the most frustrating moments. It's coupled know, with uh, some of the most exhilarating moments. It's just a test, man. It's all just in the a same week. So you can get to that next one. But like you work 12 hour shift, right? Mm -hmm. What is it, 720 minutes, something like that? On a good trauma call, I'm on scene for six minutes, maybe. Um, I'm going to the hospital, like then I'm going to the trauma pay, like maybe, maybe 20 minutes I'm with this person. And that might be the only good call I get the whole shift, 20 minutes out of all that time. And I'm so many ultra intense jobs are like that, though, yeah, yeah, where yeah. it's it's these spikes of unbelievable action and adrenaline coupled with 95 percent of your time not doing much. Yeah, of hurry up and wait. Kind yeah, of thing. the boredom, the paperwork, the administrative stuff, the sitting around and then boom, it's on. Which is good because you just fry up if you didn't. Um but um, like I, I get to go on a deployment, you know what I mean, for twelve hours, yeah, twenty four hours, and then I go home, and then I go off again for twelve or twenty four. It's great. I can leave it behind me, um, but I can still kind of mix it up and be in the middle of the action for that time. Sure. So it's um, I look at it that way. Is it is it a satisfying feeling that you operate in your hometown? It is, and it's kind of spooky at the same time. If something goes on, if there's an active shooter or somebody that has been shot in a street that's near where my kids are, um, I'm on the hook or on the phone to whoever's running that call. I'm like, you need to drive by my house right now and make sure that everybody's good. <laughs> sure. Just because I'm a freak. But um, sometimes you'll run into people that you've worked with and or worked on. And I don't, re I don't remember them or they look kind of familiar. I don't remember where they're from and like, Hey, how you doing? They sure remember you though. Yeah. Yeah. And it's either a good thing or a bad thing because maybe they were being assholes and they were getting arrested for something mm -hmm. or maybe they really were having a real hard time with something and I helped them out. It's fun. Old lady or old ladies are like the worst demographic in the world. <laughs> they're so mean. Really? <laughs> they're so pissed off and they're always getting sick and hurt, but um, they hate you and they don't, you can't do anything. You can't tell an old lady to fuck off because she's an old lady. But at the same time, they can be like the sweetest, most rewarding thing ever because they fall down. And they just, they're so thankful and they just like, well, just, there's something cultural about helping an old woman. Yeah. <laughs> helping an elderly woman because she deserves it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. 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 And it's fun. And she could have been the most, the, the most terrible mother or a grandmother or whatever in the world. I don't know. I've only known her for a couple of minutes, but I'm going to help this old lady. And yeah. It's kind of cool. Helpful to imagine her as the super nice, yeah. welcoming old, you know, grandmother. And yeah. uh, just put that image in your head while you're helping her out. <laughs> Big time. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, the concept of influencing a significant number of people in your hometown positively. That's got to be something that's, that, that feels pretty special, especially when you, know, when you think of your cumulative effect on all of the people that you've, you've touched when you've come to a, you know, you get, you got to a call and, uh, somebody was, somebody was hurt and you helped, yeah. you know, or, you know, somebody's flatlining or has a low, you know, super, super light or thready pulse and you, you kind of bring them back and get them to, get them to the emergency room, get them to the trauma bay. Uh, 
and then you do that over and over and over again. When when did you move to Greenville? Uh, about four and a half years ago. Yeah, so years now of uh, going out on calls. Yeah, and it always comes back to you, right? I mean, because um, you run into people. I mean, it's a pretty big city, but you still you'll run into these people at some point, generally, somebody that knew them or somebody that was there. It is kind of cool to be able to know that you did the right thing. Sure. Whatever the situation called for, because you know what the right thing is in that situation. You always will know what the right thing is in that situation, whether it's a, you refer to your protocols or just common sense. There's never any room for real gray area. You just, this is what you have to do. So if you meet somebody that was Looney Tunes and you treated him like, they, hey, look, you're Looney Tunes and I got to take you to the hospital and I'm, I'm going to have to tie you down. And now I'm going to have to give you an injection to make you sleepy. Um that's what the situation called for. I don't sure. have regrets for doing that. And if you have an issue, I know jujitsu. <laughs> that is, uh, it's helpful that your therapy method might, you know, right. come in handy in uh, increasing your feeling of safety on the job. That's yeah, for yeah. sure. Neon belly is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't don't need too much law enforcement help restraining a patient. No, <laughs> that's that's a convenient thing to have. But well, uh, one thing we can bring up is. Uh, highlight the the nonprofit that we want to talk about this episode, somebody that, you know, you've had a little bit of experience with and, and I have as well. Um, the one we talk about today is Upstate Warrior Solution. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, you know, they're a, they're a community-based nonprofit organization in upstate South Carolina, and their primary goal is quality of life. So they serve the warrior community by increasing quality of life, and they do it through a few different things. Uh, whether it's mentorship or, or helping veterans through their healthcare and benefits, putting them in contact with an organization that can help them with whatever they're dealing with or, or trying to accomplish. Uh, but they basically, they work on a simple model. They connect with veterans and they ed- they educate them on, on what services and opportunities are available. They advocate for veterans on, on their behalf to, to different organizations, municipalities. They work within communities and they have partners, uh, other nonprofits and organizations that they, they partner with to kind of bring services to the person that, that they're trying to benefit. And so, you know, it's a, it's a nonprofit that's full of uh, volunteers and veterans and their entire goal is quality of life for, for veterans who need it. And they're based in upstate South Carolina. So I think that's a, a great organization and they work, you know, it's not just better veterans specifically that they benefit because they work with, they work with law enforcement communities and, uh, and they're, they're kind of all over this area of upstate South Carolina. So yeah, it's um, an awesome organization too. They do. They really, um, are practical in their application of uh, helping people. They're not this weird, static, kind of rigid, um, we have to do it this way because this is what the book says. They're, um, they've really done a lot of good things around here and they're making a big impact. Yeah, yeah, awesome. It's, uh, and I think that if, if this show accomplishes anything, if we can serve to highlight some organizations out there that are doing great things in the veteran law enforcement and first responder communities, then I think we've achieved some success. So, For sure. but, uh, well, we've, we've been hanging out for about an hour and 15 minutes now. Uh, it feels like about 10, but <laughs> yeah, no, it was yeah awesome. it's an awesome talk. It, it's, it's exciting for me to learn a little bit more about it just because I, you know, I have friends that are paramedics and I, I EMT basic qualified, like so many combat arms people in the military, uh, that, that were in the military are. And, uh, but, to hear a little bit about kind of how you as an individual manage, you know, manage the cases you get called to and the, the day in and day out and, and and where you get your purpose, uh, for the work you do. That's, uh, that's a, that's a fun conversation for me to be able to have and and understand a little bit more about, but yeah, well, thanks for having me on, man. Awesome. Well, thanks. Thanks for listening to the second episode of the fear and courage podcast. On our next episode, we'll have Major General Retired Dave Burford, who played an instrumental role in special operations leadership following the attacks on 9-11.